Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald and in this week we have a very special guest. He is the chief designer for the Borgward Design Studio here in Germany, in Stuttgart to be exact, who has quite a bit of experience of design as a business, you know, building studios, uh, you know, working with a Chinese background and understanding how important the design department and the, the general idea of design is within a global corporation. This will be, you know, the episode and interview with Benjamin, in short, Ben Nauka. So please do enjoy the conversation. And of course, also this week's episode is brought to you and sponsored by our lovely little tool that we have created, which is called Pathfinder. Pathfinder allows you to find internships for students, graduates. Uh, it will also allow design managers, design studios to find the latest interns, uh, the latest entry-level position graduates to join you in your team, to give you the new, the newest, the latest, the freshest ideas to build up your studio, to develop your studio and making it future-proof for the 21st century. Uh, the students or the people that are registered and part of our Pathfinder family do come from all creative universities worldwide. So we have representatives from Germany, from the UK, from the US, from China, from Korea, Japan, you name it. So I'm pretty sure if you're looking for young, fresh talent, you will find it there. And of course, you can also share your latest internship opportunities and entry-level opportunities with the community on Pathfinder. It comes with a seven-day trial period. Uh, after that, there is a yearly subscription that you would have to sign off to but i'm pretty sure that you will find exactly what you need on there if you're looking for new creative talent not just within design but also within 3d modeling and visualization but that's it for now from that side enjoy the conversation with ben and of course as always if you like this podcast and this episode in particular give us five stars on iTunes or any kind of rating that you you might be using. If you have any questions, do contact us on uh, the, the general social media outlets with the connective point at Concept House and let us know if you have any further questions. Now, let's move on. Let's start the show. Enjoy. Ben Nauka. Welcome to the show and thanks for taking the time for having this little conversation with me. It's a pleasure and we've been planning this for such a long time. This is going to be a good one. Uh, so I do appreciate we're sitting here at like, you know, just half past eight in the evening. So thank you very much for taking the time and welcome to this episode of the Gestalten Podcast. Thanks, Martin. My pleasure, likewise. <laughs> Happy that it finally happens. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So uh, we have to say, obviously, we've known each other for for quite a long time already. We had a a lot of conversations over the past years, um, I would have to say. And there's one topic that we want to talk about today, which is design and the idea of business behind it. So not necessarily just about you know design as a as a supplier or something like that, but really design as part of a grander business mm -hmm. because you have a little bit of experience with that. But before we jump into that topic. How about you tell our listeners just a tiny little bit of your background, where you've studied, um, and of course, how long you have been in your current position at Borgward. All right. So, well, my name is Benjamin, Benjamin Nauka, and um, I'm the chief designer of the Borgward Group. Um, I'm in this position since uh, June 2012 already, so <laughs> quite a while. And... Um, Yeah, I was uh, classically studying transportation design at Pforzheim University and uh, had a chance uh, during the studies to uh, work and live uh, abroad in the U.S. twice in the greater Los Angeles area and in Taiwan, Taipei. So but a little bit of, of, of a sneak peek into international culture and other co-working and got addicted to that. And um, I think looking at my position today was a very helpful experience. And so from, from your personal experience, you have not just been with an OEM before, but you've also started off your career at a supplier. 
So you have both the experience of really working as a supplier as well as from the OEM side, which I think nowadays is quite unique. It's not necessarily the the normal way of doing things, if I can remember. Most of the, the car designers jump right into the OEM culture. Um, yeah. Yeah, From yeah, that's right. Belief. Yeah, I, I started my career at Mercedes-Benz Technology, uh, which is now ACA, and um, it was very, very helpful because um, at that time there was, <laughs> like today, a little bit of a crisis going on, and the uh, positions at OEMs were um, not existent. Uh, still, this was a good way to go um, to to a, a company which is very closely attached to an OEM, which actually was a part of the OEM Daimler AG at that time, and. Um, Seeing the business side uh, from a supplier side uh, is very helpful because you see how crucial time, budget, team coordination is and delivering also uh, results which are of interest to the customer. And at the same time, um, you know, I was uh, already at the position also working on the OM side as well. It's like seeing okay, how does it, how is it perceived? You know, how does it, you know, just come over the fence? And uh, where is the chances and risks to, to get it shown and accepted or um, how to approach the right people to, to get hurt? So this is obviously a very interesting background. And that's why we decided as well to talk about and, you know, we, we will in the long term make a little bit of a series out of this with, with other people talking about the idea about business and design as well. But if we start off with your current kind of position, so chief designer at Borgward, and obviously you have a studio in Germany. You're very well connected and, and very much connected with your Chinese colleagues, of course, as well. What do you think in, in these kind of grander schemes of companies? What is, what, what is for the non-design person design and how is it being perceived in general from your personal experience? Uh, it's, it's one word. It's just taste. It's personal taste, actually. Two words. Um, if, if as, as a non-designer, you're a decision maker, um, all you can do, and there's nothing wrong about it, is judging by your personal taste and um, by the persons uh, and experiences around you. So if you know that, um, it helps you a lot as a designer, as a creative guy who wants to push you know, for, for beauty, as an example, or for a unique design. Um, it's really helpful if you know that um, to to understand feedback and also to react to feedback or comments. And how do you address these kind of people? I mean, is is there is there a different kind of way of talking to them, or is there you know trying to educate them on how design works, or what what is what is the general kind of way? I think you know what let's say eighty ninety percent of the of the car design chiefs would do, and how would they how would they communicate with these top levels? Well, I, th I think one of the, the most important things is patience. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I don't think there is a golden way uh, to, to catch uh, your decision maker to make a decision uh, in your favor or into the direction you would like to, to pursue. Um, I, I have the joy to, to have quite a, a lot of different um, high-level decision makers to present to, and I had the chance to learn from them, but also to adapt to them. And this is also one thing uh, which, which you need to learn is that you need to grab everyone a little differently. You know, everybody is an individual person. And, um, there is decision makers, uh, billionaires who are completely design driven and, uh, still don't know how a design process, car design process, especially, you know, is being lived. Um, on the other hand, you have just people who, who look for money and for, for a uh, brand name and, uh, just let, let things go. Uh, without uh, making a proper judgment if, if this mm -hmm. is the right for the brand. So um, it's a lot of a lot of conversation. It's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of um, repetition of, of um, topics that that you think you mm -hmm. are important. And um, it's also a lot of um, compromise. And uh, the artist to to find your own level of uh, compromise. <laughs> okay, so so let's talk about this compromise a little bit. Like, how how do you achieve that? I mean, you know, you have you as the designer, you understand the process, but when the stakeholder comes and does a review with you and just doesn't have the ability of communicate why they like something, just to say like, oh, I like this better. How how can you what what can you do? 
um, to make an actual business decision out of this because otherwise it's just taste you know it's just like oh i like this i like that but can you know do do these people also understand that just based on taste they cannot risk let's say you know a billion dollar budget just to do a car yeah um it's it's um, in the ideal case you have done a lot of um pre-presentation work um, with with your colleagues from the engineering department from the marketing department and from the the, the finance department because at the end uh, you have a couple of, of proposals uh, let's say abc and uh, you would like to have a decision on that and as a professional designer you should be able to also answer the questions of oh have you checked that with the marketing team you know and what's their response and uh, have you probably done a, a, a internal survey or clinic before or even a professional customer clinic to check if, if a, a new brave approach is being accepted or not and um, so at the end you should have just a couple of proposals on the wall which which should satisfy the designer's um, dream vision of of the brand of the of the product uh, at the same time you should be very much aware maybe more aware than the classic oem um, how how sensible people are to costs to timings and also um especially when it comes to brief decisions um how to get people into a certain comfort zone with an uncomfortable question or decision and how would you usually do that is that is is that literally just because of a presentation or would you would you push people towards these kind of situations from a from a design perspective or do you have to be careful of just like making you know maybe only doing that once so that you're not pissing off your your decision makers too much it's a little bit dependent on the time you have but usually um if there's time um uh, it's, it's step by step I, I, it's like launching a rocket you know there's like mm. the first the second the third step <laughs> <laughs> and um um it's like if, if, if because you know if, if you don't succeed in the first step you know things are getting more complicated in the second and maybe impossible in the third step so in um, an ideal case, an ideal um, time plan, uh, you have multiple chances to to present your ideas and uh, your 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 dreams, your visions uh, to the decision maker. Um, because then you also have a chance to understand mm -hmm. his or her thinking and his or her feedback. Because uh, we need to also understand that feedback from these people is very um and uh, uh don't get me wrong, wrong it's like in a very simple way you know they, they don't they don't own the design language they don't uh, know what stands is you know or they don't really understand what is what is the math behind as an example so you need to tell them you said it in the beginning the educational way what is stance and if you really figure out if this is one of your key key features of your car and they don't get it then you need to so just uh, go a step back and you know just say okay let me give you a couple of examples you know this is the benchmark this is a good stance, this is a bad stance, you know, and how, what should we do in our cars to improve as an example? So it's a lot of showing examples, showing um, benchmarking, you know, I mean, especially Chinese companies are, are very much into benchmarking, but not in the way that uh, we, sh we, we look as a designer, especially to the cars which are on the market. Mm -hmm. That's maybe just a proof of concept, but um, also, you know, convincing them what is a trend and what is the upcoming trends. And especially if, if you talk about upcoming trends, uh, you need to take the lead sometimes and just tell them, okay, guys, um, there is a car show coming up or there is a new product just being presented, you know, um, or, or there is a trade show like the CES coming up. So maybe if you have time, let's wait another week or two. Let's go there together, have a look and then make a judgment again. How do how do these guys react to that? I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, it's for me in, in that kind of sense, what, what, the experience that I've had a lot is when the designer feels comfortable and, you know, also let, let's say sees himself in a certain kind of position of power because he can talk in a language that not everybody understands. Um, you know, it, it's, it usually ends badly for them um, because it's, if you have a CEO on your side that doesn't necessarily understand what you're talking about, the likeliness that that person is going to say no is going to be much higher so how do they react to when you say like oh let's go to the show let's let, let us show you what the future is or like you know let us show you what these kind of new trends are can you can you it's almost like you know seduce them to become interested in design without making too many you know or impactful decisions in very early stages where you say eh, let, let us let us work this because i th i think it's 
I see the problem oftentimes is that there's either too much involvement of high level management or not just enough because then they don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. It's it's not necessarily seducing the the, the, the high level guys. It's really catching uh, the right moment and trying to understand their situation. And um, I mean, I'm I'm also trying to put myself into their position to make a decision on on something which which has a big impact on the success of the brand and of the product. So um, there is a moment where you can just say to 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 stay to the example. Let's go to a show, have a look, you know. But if 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 it's clearly like, oh, they would lose their face right now because there's too many people staying around, you know, I would just not ask this question in this uh, particular um, meeting, but try to get this chance afterwards. Um, especially also in the Asian Chinese culture, you know, uh, what is being made before and after the meetings sometimes is even more important <laughs> than within the meetings. So. Um, in this respect, it's just um, trying to 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 just tell them, you know, um, let let me help you to make a better decision. You know, let me just help you to make a a a a, a better way of of also um, giving feedback from your side because it's not just their design understanding. Sometimes it's also just language. Even if you have a mm. translator, you know, um, we have had we have had just to give an example feedback of you know, ah, well, this headlamp looks shit, you know. And by shit, <laughs> you don't mean it's a shitty headlamp. <laughs> it's just like they didn't yeah. like a particular detail about that. But all they didn't know is like how to express that. So before I'm saying nothing or before I'm not approving something, they just say that, that's mm. what I don't like basically. So And how do you, how how do you designers deal with that? I mean if you're in a review and obviously you're used to that because you've been with the company for a certain amount of time, you you know, you do understand what what technically it means it's, it's almost like reading in between the lines but when you have your designers that are not communicating with these kind of top level management every single day how do you prepare them for that how do you prepare them for this hardcore business side of not just having a nice sketch over here and talk about you know cool things and creative things all day but really bringing down the numbers in that sense i are they receptive to that are there guys who are just like i don't even want to be in there because i i have absolutely no interest in that or what what is your experience of the let's say average designer that you have worked with when it comes to these business made decisions and do they respect them or do they even say just like oh they have no idea uh, no, I think that's that's a crucial part of also leading a team and to 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 generate continuous good input from the team because um, the decision making process is very complicated. It's very complex, and um, as you say, a, a junior designer, you know, who is just probably stepping into the business, or even a senior designer, which which has worked mm-hmm. in a very structured environment before, and doesn't know how decisions are being made in a different environment. And uh, my strategy always is to to talk to the team before and and especially if there's newcomers into the team, telling them, okay, hey, this is our culture, this is the decision making process, this is how usually feedback is being given, this is how we react, and um, if this word or that word is being dropped, that means you know um, do or don't. A classic, a classic, very classic uh, example is if if someone from 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 the top management says, I have a suggestion, you know, <laughs> this means do it. It's not a suggestion. Yeah. I mean, to do it, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, so, this kind of transparency, this kind of just trying to 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 give an insight and in how a presentation will look like, um, helps to also um, make make the, uh, the the designers more happy. Because also, it happens uh, quite quite often actually that the proposal which the designer believes is really good and I believe mm-hmm. is really good just kicks out, and then it comes comes back to 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 the management. To put it back into the game, you know, that's probably one of the advantages in a in a, a in this kind of environment that uh, if something gets deselected, uh, you will have chances if you do it quite smartly to get those proposals back into the game, and not just once, but maybe even twice or three times. So it's this kind of openness from both sides that needs to be mm-hmm. respected, and uh, it's it's but also a question for me of politeness. This is what I also asked at the beginning uh, was. Uh, how 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 my how how pushy basically you know do you need to be as a designer or design chief to to get a decision made you know I mean there's uh, plenty of, of uh, good designers out there who are very pushy very kind of demanding their decisions kind of mm. take it or leave it style and this for sure is something which does not work in mean, Chinese or um, Asian way it only works with a let's say if you have a certain standing I think on the highest levels as well I would even say like on let's say you know Western soil. If you are too pushy, it only works if you really have the full trust of the board. 
Like, you know, if you can back it up Correct. in yeah. such a high level that you can do almost whatever you want and you will get the backing. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily happen uh, very often. Uh, I, I, from, from at least my personal experience in, in that sense. But how, yeah. how do you prepare? your your colleagues for something like that because I, you know I, i i had a conversation with lutz fugener and we were talking about um you know the the, the head of a uh, bachelor's degree at the university uh, university of Pforzheim for transportation design and he said you know we're, we're obviously trying to get our um our students to understand the entire design process much more and that design is not necessarily just about you know creating or doing 3d models but there's a there's a business aspect to it there's a marketing aspect to it there's an engineering aspect to it when you know students come up to you or like you know graduates starting with you um do you think those guys are do really have an understanding what this business is all about do you really do you personally think that they know what design is or do you think they're still artists and how can you train them i'd say that um Most of them are artists in a positive way. This kind of uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, positive in, in the early <laughs> stage, <laughs> um, because it's always kind of a little bit like a wake-up call or a, a this, this just general questioning of why do we do it like this? You know, why does it look like that? You know, and can we do this differently? I think those questions are very important, and we should ask them day by day. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to, to, to timings, to deliveries, <laughs> to presentations, and to translation a sketch into a model, um, a lot of training is, is necessary. Because um, a sketch, I always say this also to my leadership when, when I kind of discuss with them what they see on the wall. So this is the best you can get. You know, um, maybe, maybe a next and Maya model will do a similar job, but you know, a, a very nice sketch you know, with a very strong theme And this is the nicest of the car you will ever see. Everything afterwards will just get step by step worse. So um, this is also what a, a, a junior designer um, needs to understand. And my recipe is to to give them as soon as possible guidance. You know, either by a senior designer or a lead designer, or just let them translate or sketch onto a, a a package. You know, we have, if you have a production car, of course you make a lot of great sketches. But translating your sketch then at the end to something which is potentially a meter slimmer on the inside, on the interior, and and uh, has, has a lot bigger steering wheel and uh, shifter envelopes and, and lever envelopes and, and epic positions. Um, if, if, if at least someone was running through this pro uh, process at once, um, I think the understanding is there. And uh, without that, it's difficult to let junior designers understand what this business is about. Do you personally think that somebody can learn to become um i would say a manager understanding the the idea of of the business aspect the corporate levels um do you think somebody can learn that or do you think somebody's almost like born into it uh, that's pro probably uh, need need a quantification to that to <laughs> ask more people <laughs> but um I think it's 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 you you can learn it. I think it's a little bit um, dependent on your um, attitude, because you need to understand that a car is a very very complex product. That the development time is fairly long. That you have to put together a lot of pieces, and that design is just one of many many departments which is included into making this happen. And um, this, I think, this is the first and, and the crucial understanding of, of of how things got together. You know, uh, back at my first job, you know, I was uh, part um, part uh, how you say manager of of or uh, partly responsible. Let's put it this way for uh, the design strategy of the current GLC and uh, C class, as an example. And uh, I was running into those uh, Thursday meetings, eight hours, nine hours in a row, just sitting together with everybody. From the engine, from from the aerodynamics, from the wheels, from the finance, from the dealers, they had to give continuous feedback back and forth. And just by sitting in there for half a year, you know, or even longer, I was learning so much about what a car is about. And I also heard the others' um, opinion about design. And I would could also learn, you know, quickly uh, what design needed to do to get hurt. And um, I think this is something which 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 uh, will help every designer to understand, okay, the complexity of a product like the car shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, 
nothing is wrong to be an artist. Nothing is wrong of dreaming big, but uh, you should always understand also the task and the role you are given. You know, if, if you get asked to make something fancy, fancy, do it, you know. But if you get asked to make a, the mainstream car and you try to make a spaceship out of that, you will fail. Yeah, and you will uh, very likely get a lot of issues within the companies as well. <laughs> Let's put it that way, because... You know, it's it's, it's everybody sure. yeah. is going left and you're going right. I mean, this in certain instances can help you and uh, and your career, of course. But in oftentimes, there is a reason why a company goes towards the left or towards the right, uh, and it wants everybody to push into into one direction. I think that's that's always important to remember. Now, when we when we talk about these developments and really understanding what it what it means to move into management. When was the first time when you realized that your life is now depending a bit more on Excel sheets rather than on sketches that you have done yourself? Basically, already at the, the, the MB Tech in the first, in the first uh, part of my career because I was um, it's, but it was moving up fairly fast and Excel sheets was, was almost from the beginning part of my, 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 my education. I'm still not a fan of Excel sheets, to be honest. I'm still not a big fan of PowerPoint. I prefer Photoshop uh, and sketch modeling and play modeling <laughs> <above> all. But <laughs> um, I also learned that this, uh, for certain people, uh, is the right and only mm. right tool to communicate. Um, if if you make let's put it this way, for instance, timing plans. You know, if you if there is a system behind that, our company is, is using Excel in this case, not 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 a specific program for that. So um, it's of course extremely helpful if you know how this program works and how you can edit it and how you can just uh, delete stuff, blah blah. And at the same time, if you have a a cost structure of of your car, you know, and get together all the bomb costs. Um, it's helpful if, if you can read an Excel sheet where all this is inside to understand, okay, what do we, where is a potential cut cost, uh, cu cost cutting uh, position, which will affect the design. So I, I figured out that this is a, a, a tool which, which I need to understand, know, and use fairly soon <laughs> and uh, still doing it. <coughs> However, um, there is uh, fortunately a design management departments and program management departments which are taking the lead on that and uh, put in your your comments. <laughs> <laughs> But do you think that you know for to to build this kind of next step of um, of a design generation, um, would do you believe that they should they should become less caring about let's say numbers about budgets or do you think they should actually become more caring about these things because with you know the way i see it is it seems like it, things become easier because you can just almost go to like an amazon style marketplace and buy your components so you know exactly what your components components are you can go to companies such as volkswagen and ask them to use their platform and uh, you know they probably even help you to engineer the entire thing so it seems to me that the knowledge a designer has to build Uh, for the future is becoming much more and they need to understand much more about the process of actually building a car without going into too much detail um, of this. I mean, this, this is this is what I find interesting in this current kind of climate that we have with electrification, with autonomous driving, the digitalization that comes into everything is that it's almost like a Lego puzzle and you just need to understand like how, how I can manipulate these Lego bricks to build something Uh, that is, let's say, physically uh, or even digitally much more attractive and much more aesthetic than, you know, maybe what the, the original instruction was like. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, um, I think the budgets uh, which, which we had in the past for developing a car will be continually cut um, because uh, the competitiveness, the price competition on the market and uh, also the, the, the offers for the customers are, are huge. And um, it's not just helpful for, for the company um, if the designer understands at least a little bit, uh, let's say more than the basics of, of, of the cost structure of the car, because it will also help the designer to focus. It's like if, if, if you have a certain amount of budget for, for, for your, let's say, exterior, and you are really well into a, a certain detail, let's say a laser light or a, 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 a some illuminated surfacing, blah, blah. 
then you need to know how much does it cost. And if you know that, you should try to figure out, okay, how much of the, the overall budget, which is being approved already, is it? And then you can make a decision on your own. Uh, how important is it for you to fight for it hardcore, you know, until the end? Because maybe if you, if you save that feature, you can get bigger rims or a more detailed grill detail, uh, grill insert or a, a more fancy door handle or no mirrors, blah, blah, you know? So uh, it helps you to balance also what is really important, you know, what is which feature, which, which, which theme, which element is something that is so important for my design that I cannot compromise on that. And who makes that decision? Is that decision being made on the highest level? Is that, you know, made by you? Is that made by the team? Because obviously, like, if you want to, you know, it's almost like taking, taking you know, the lollipop away from, from a kid with the kid as the designer. They obviously don't want to lose anything. So how is that decision being made on what is priority? Um, in the ideal case, it's, it's the, the first step as a designer. And um, it's not necessarily like taking away lollipop because at the end, it's uh, the step before. It's like you have pocket, <laughs> pocket money, you have your two euros and how you want to spend it. You know, you can you can probably buy uh, five pieces of chocolate or one giant lollipop. <laughs> so, <laughs> in this respect, I think the first step is is really um, the the designer, and um, maybe he needs help in making a decision, or maybe he is so convincing that he says, "Okay, let's let's try to convince our leadership to spend some extra money on that." And this is when when a management pops in to say, "Okay, if you, if if someone convinces, you know." Classically, the management, uh, if this is a good idea, I'm all in for fighting for it. You know, I'm very supportive and I really try to, to, to really listen to the story, to, to understand also the, the, the purpose of, of the design. And if it's really good and if we say it's going to really help the brand, the car, the product to, to, to stand out of the crowd, um, then we go all the way to 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 the other management uh, levels to fight for it. I, I find this so interesting because you know we're, we're we're talking about this creative process that becomes almost like a bureaucratic decision making, and obviously that is very much you know oftentimes it's not democratic. It's uh, <laughs> it's probably more the opposite of it. But let let me let me ask you this straight up, and you know obviously I I understand if you maybe don't wanna um, don't wanna answer this, but. Is your job like you know more fulfilling when smaller things happen, or do you think it's it's oftentimes you know seeing just the final product and seeing what you were able to put into it uh, really the point where you say this is what we're working for? Because I, you know, on 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 these every single day small disappointments, but they can rack up, and you don't obviously want to make sure that your your people around them getting frustrated by that, but. How how do you keep them going with these kind of ideas? Because especially what you just mentioned, the budgets are being, you know, made smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and and what do you do in that kind of circumstances? Not just to become a little, let's say, internal supplier, but really being an important team of of shaping the company. Uh, well, it's it's um, willing to to answer this question, of course. Just um, it's. A little bit of both, I would say. I mean, of course, all the small little steps, um, all the small little achievements make me happy. Because if if you go through a couple of programs, which I did in the past, you know, uh, you really see how difficult it is sometimes to just get a decision through. And if if there was just, uh, let's say, eight out of ten of your 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 fantastic ideas just uh, got killed. Um, there's two ways. Either you appreciate that at least two made it, or you're completely frustrated that the eight got killed. And um, here again, it comes to the repetition. Um, I've had so many situations that uh, in, in the early stages of a project, uh, good ideas got killed because of taste, of budgets, of, of bad you know, presentation, maybe communication or understanding, maybe a mixture of everything. And uh, just in the right moment, you, you you sneak it back in, you pop it in because someone is asking the right question. You said, see, we got that. We have an answer here. And then you have a big impact again. So um, this is also what what uh, I, I tell tell the designers and the design team is like, um, if, if something gets deselected or not selected to the extent you would like to have, it's, it's of course a mischance, but it's not a dead end. You know, it's something which maybe for this program or for this facelift, or even just for this model year update, didn't go through. But maybe, and we had this many, many times, you know, it's it's coming back with the next program, with the next project. 
you know, I've had topics five years ago, I tell you, six years ago, um, where we really wanted to push in things. And this was really frustrating. We didn't get it. And now we all get them now. Because now time proved that, yeah, it's right. You know, if this is a conundrum concept, that this is a, 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 a special treatment of light, you know, all those things which were predictable for design a couple of years before, now find their way into our production course. So uh, it's the satisfaction needs a little bit more time potentially. Than <laughs> well, but, you know, in, in the end, if you look into even the biggest ones over here in Europe and in the U.S., Either the the best concepts come out in the shortest amount of time, you know, or it it, it just needs to mm. needs to be proven over time. That's that's the way it is. Or, or you need to have a pressure yep. situation. I think if you look into Volkswagen in particular, that pressure situation of now going into electric vehicles um, have probably kept them a little bit more on their toes and on their feet. Uh, than they maybe would have done over the past 10, 15 years uh, in terms of, you know, bringing something new to the table just because they had to. And obviously Tesla plays a role in that as well into that kind of direction. Now, when we when when we really look into these kind of decision-making processes and understanding how, you know, design is becoming part of the entire business unit um, in, 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 in a corporation, can be small, can be big what do you think from maybe your own experience but also maybe from looking you know from the outside into other companies where do you think designers should take more responsibility or should should kind of step up within the within the business i mean is there any you know like in reviews of course but do you think designers should also have a much bigger impact on business decisions being made you know we're talking about uh you know user experience a lot at the moment which always is interested because of sometimes it is within a design department sometimes it's a completely different uh, a different department sometimes it's with marketing so it seems like there's there's a lot of opportunity out there but i i sometimes have the feeling that maybe a lot of the design departments are not really interested in taking that responsibility in the higher level of a business <laughs> they should. <laughs> they should. It's a very statement from my side it's like um you know, you can't complain about not getting hurt and you can't complain about not getting your design through if you miss the chance to make yourself noticeable. noticed. Um, uh, there's, there's so much evidence out there um, that uh, successful design helps to elevate the brand in terms of brand recognition, uh, brand perception, you know, image elevation and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I encourage actually also my people to to, to go into dialogue, to really check with marketing, check with the engineers, check with the finance guys regularly, you know, internally in the team, you know, cross divisional into your extra HMI uh, or, or user experience, you know, just, you know, talk to each other, you know, have a look, you know, just, just uh, check on your idea and then check, you know, if it still uh, lasts after you talked to, to, to those people already. And um, I think, um, also on the broader picture of the company, I think it's very, very important that that um, people understand the individual needs of, of, of each department because at the end, we shouldn't forget that uh, who's paying mm. our salaries is the cars which are on the market and being sold. You know, it's, it's not necessarily your your VP or, or the president. It's, it's overall the sales mm. of, of your product. And um, for that, I'm a big fan of, you know, cross-divisional uh, corporation to just uh, say, guys, uh, we need to make sure that we are on the same page. Ideally, the ideal presentation to a, a president or chairman is to say, okay, you have a couple of proposals. It's completely cross-checked with all the necessary departments. So all the questions you normally have are already asked. So you just need to make a decision mm -hmm. to A, B, or C. You know, they are all within the finance, within the timing, within the, 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 the target group, within the marketing strategy and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, yeah, this, this, this is the responsibility of the design and also design, um, I, I, at least that's my subjective perception. You know, we are kind of a not point in big corporations, you know, because we have so much interaction with all those departments. You know, we have such an insight into the companies and we are involved in so many strategic and mm. early decisions that uh, this is a chance, uh, which, which a designer should grab to, to promote their thinking, their ideas, their knowledge, 
into what's next because i mean that's that's the biggest question for all companies you know what's next what's the next big thing <laughs> if you don't know what it is sorry it's like just um, can we yeah. at least be a fast follower to that yeah to not lose do you growth? think that the design department will change towards um other ideas as well i mean i'm i'm thinking currently a lot about this idea about uh you know business design in that sense so that you're not just designing a product or you know you're designing a screen or something like that but you're helping to really design a service you know maybe a new business model that the company could follow through so usually you know things that is being done in, in certain kind of departments but it seems to me that design is so early in the process of developing a product or you know a, an experience that it almost becomes natural why not you know build on new business models um in in the future as well it seems a little bit far-fetched far-fetched at, at the moment especially in the car industry but um it, it it could certainly be the case that you know somebody in your position uh, might have a team leader or a chief uh, under him or her who is then in charge of you know the haptic design then you have the business design you have experience design and this comes all together uh, almost like the idea of a CDO, but then again, a lot of people have no idea what a CDO is actually supposed to do. But uh, it, 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 I see it very possible that we go into that kind of way if certain kind of thinking processes uh, change or mindset change. Fully agree. Fully agree. I mean, um, the the position of a to just pick this up of a CDO, I think, is something which should be incorporated into into companies uh, of any size uh, because this just is one of the rare chances to get really hurt um, regularly on a yeah. high level base which is helpful in making quick decisions which are sometimes really necessary um to the other uh, topic it's it's for me I'm, I'm a very true believer that this the separation of exterior interior color and trim uh, even hmi and to a certain extent you know um, i think will disappear over the next couple of years you know i, I even made uh, uh, a speech to my people and uh, you know i'm a promoter of the idea that i mean we are automotive designers first hand, but we will develop into experienced designers because a car is part of a company mm. or corporate experience and um we have seen you know what the classic now now the classic examples are coming like apple you know um that the product is one important part of it, but it's not the start at the end. You know, it's 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 one piece of the big puzzle, and I think that here a designer is a very useful, um, almost tool for a company to check how big this puzzle is and how big the pieces that design can cover actually is, because I think it's it's many, and also in the car design, you know, is like a a a, a extra designer should know about interior design, should know about color and trim, because I think those last uh, two disciplines are, are gaining up speed uh, dramatically, um, if not even overruling. And uh, user experience, um, of course, I mean, what, what makes the customer happy? It's, of course, a nice looking car. It's, of course, a, a, a sensation of beauty. But at the end, he will also say this was a nice experience, you know, not just by looking at it, but just by, how you say, feeling it, driving it. You know, smelling it, hearing it, interacting with it. What's your personal opinion about collaborations? Obviously, you mentioned already internal collaborations with other departments just to get better decision making for you know the, the the decision takers in that sense. But where do you see something you know such as different companies com combining their strengths? And I'm talking about maybe a car company with a tech company that is obviously happening to a certain degree already, but car company and a service company, all these kind of things coming together and building new ideas from a creative perspective. So far, it seems over the past 10, 15 years, um, obviously, you know, the, the car industry was strong enough. Somebody would maybe even say arrogant enough to say, we do everything we do in-house, but it seems that in this current climate that we have in the development that we have, partnering will be an essential point and that also means that opening up your design not just literally in terms of opening your doors because you have to collaborate but also asking your your designers and your your design staff to think differently about certain things absolutely um i think collaboration will be essential in the future um first of all because 
the product or the components are getting much more complex and um, also complicated literally in the development. Not necessarily in the product you see at the end, but the whole way until it's being ready to use. This is, this is very complex. You know, I think one of the best examples is the, is the whole um, uh, HMI system in the car. Um, you can make in-house developments. Uh, you can make your own maps. You can make your own um, uh, operating system if you want. But then you need to know, okay, how much effort it is to to make an integration of all the other operating systems. You know, with your, all the other mobile devices. And uh, it's such a simple sentence in the past years. You know, oh, we just in integrate all of our mobile devices into the car. But uh, it doesn't seem to be that easy, funnily, you know. And uh, <laughs> and um, in this respect, I think um, I'm always looking to aviation industries a little bit. It's like, you know, at the end, uh, if, if you are an aviation company, you know, an airline brand, you know, uh, you're also recognized for 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 your soft services, for your product, you know, for your um, booking experience, for your flight experience, for um, the, the friendliness of, of, of staff and so on and so forth. And uh, the seats which you have in your aircraft, you buy them at, at, at Recaro or at, at another company, you know, it's not that they develop them on their own, that even Airbus are doing or Boeing are doing that, you know. So it's kind of collaboration in fashion is happening as well, you know. Remova Dior just launched a, a, a suitcase thing. I think it's it's part of part of the future of the car design business. And I also believe it's really beneficial for both sides. Because you, I mean, you visited um, potentially CES as well. It's like you see that the tech companies are moving into automotive, and automotive are moving into tech. So um, if you just make cherry picking on both sides, I think this makes is the car product. industry or the car design industry actually ready for that, or is it is it still? I don't want to say living under a rock, but is it still compared to the tech industry behind and you know needs to change something? Mm, uh, ooh, difficult to judge because um, I don't have insight into uh, <laughs> a lot of OEMs. <laughs> um, I think it's it's really dependent on the on the company culture, you know. Um, it is also dependent on on if there is a slogan in the company. Let's say, yeah, we open up, yeah, we speed up, yeah, let's be more techy. Mm. It's really being lift because you know talking is one thing, acting is the other. And um, let's put it this way: I think there is companies outside where. There is an understanding that they need to really speed up, you know, look around, you know, partner up with, with tech companies and at least make, make, try to look for synergies to make the product more competitive. And there's others who say, okay, we try to do this in house mm -hmm. uh, because we do have the budgets. We do want to protect our intellectual property, which is not to be underestimated, I have to say. But um, you get a feeling, let's put it this way, if you if you have some talks on the designers' night, that um, there is room <laughs> for improvement. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I certainly believe there is room for improvement, and I think that mm -hmm. um, this would even start with the fact, you know, ve very simple kind of direction is like hiring different people. I mean, it starts already. We see that especially when in the digital space, uh, you know, UX, UI, people that have never had any contact with the car industry before, now work in the car industry. Um, but I think it also goes into, especially in interiors, Colin Trim has always been like, you know, fashion involved, of course, but uh, especially in interiors where you can see more and more people from a product background and industrial background making a, a comeback, you know, in going into, uh, into uh, car design in particular, or mobility design, because it, it becomes almost like, you know, uh, you know, people people want to have these kind of standardized systems, oftentimes just to make it to make more, to make it quicker. Uh, you know, maybe to to work towards a time frame of a product. You know, we had a we had a conversation with Sonny Lim from from Puma recently, and he talked to us about that the fashion process that they have is six months. Now, obviously, if you can do that in a car industry, that would be you know incredible, like doing a new interior every six months. But it almost seems like something like this has to happen because the demand that you see, in particular in China, where you know the speed of a new car, like the facelift, comes like a year later already. Is, is almost on that level. You know what I mean? So like, it seems like something does need to change, not just on the digital space, what Tesla is doing, where they up, where they upgrade uh, and update your, your infotainment system or like, you know, HMI system very regularly, but almost at, you know, on, on, on your car side as well, on your, on your haptic side. 
absolutely and i think this is also a, a big point for for the residual value of a car because um, if you have a look 20 years back from now you know where do you see the most that the cars are old mm. is because of technology because it's, it's what what they use in the in, in interior there is there's cassette players there are still cd players there is there is five inch <laughs> navigation screens with with bad resolution and 256 colors um no matter how beautiful the shape around is, no, no matter how, how, how great your Poltrona Frau leather is, you know, and this makes your car look mm. old immediately. And this has a complete big impact on, on, on the decision making process of buying probably a used car, now, even a new car, you know, for, for, for the customer, because the strive for continuous updating for, for being, you know, on the edge continuously, you know, it's not the worst majority of the customers potentially but still it's very helpful and if you if you understand that your your product needs to be let's put it mm -hmm. kind of update ready from the beginning um the designer should uh, also think very smartly to see how we can achieve that you know it's like how we can achieve you know with our uh, platform sub supplier you know for for the for the hux screen and for the head unit you know for instance how we can ensure that in two three years we are still on par you know or is by design allowing exchanging maybe maybe the screen mm -hmm. to a better um, oled or, or whatever 4k solution you know um during a service or for for the second part of their life life cycle you know so i think this kind of text thinking tech thinking is, is, is uh, very important for the designers to understand and uh, not just on the hardware side but also on the software side of course last question based on this and then i get you the um you know everybody gets the the, the, the big three questions in the end but <laughs> <All right. laughs> um but kind of finishing this topic off and a little bit more speculative for the future do you think that the current transportation slash mobility design student is prepared for these changes or do you think the industry needs to do more to, to prepare them for these changes? Do you think it's an educational system or it should be an industry uh, led approach? I think um, also both because um, like, like with any educational part, I think um, over the years you need to adapt. I think the industry should, should, should make people aware on their internships, especially, or when they have uh, cooperation projects with the universities to say, okay, let you think about that, you know, how you can make your product attractive mm -hmm. 20 years down the road. Well, what's your answer to that? And at the same time, um, also the universities can ask their students, okay, based on your knowledge, um, because this is more probably from the customer point of view, um, what do you think is appropriate? Which is the appropriate steps or measures or actions uh, to, to, to make it happen mm -hmm. that, you know, 20 years down the road, your design is not just being perceived as beautiful and well proportioned, but also still modern, still usable. Um, because, you know, you can't expect from a, from a student that he goes to the CES or, or to, to, to whatever some tech shows, uh, South by Southwest, those things, you know, which are really, really mm. inspiring. Potentially yes. more than any car show, unfortunately, but, um, <laughs> and this is, this is again where the companies could jump in, but I think it's, it's really both. It's, 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 you're really making aware our young talents and there are out there so many, you know, keep track, stay, stay, stay up, you know, just look around the corners. Don't just think car, think really the big experience. Think how your car, your design is part of a big, fantastic puzzle. And without your piece, it's not a nice puzzle. And just your puzzle <laughs> is not complete, you know. So this respect, I think this is the yeah, thinking. That's a, that's a nice little word uh, to end the conversation. So uh, Ben, already, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, but as mentioned before, I let you go. You will get three questions from me, um, and I know you have heard these questions before because you've listened to one or two episodes of the podcast. <laughs> so, question number one, being asked to anybody, and obviously can be uh, doesn't have to be a car project, can be pretty much anything. So, um, which project that you did not participate in would you have absolutely loved to be a part of? Oh, almost. Any other yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I, I admire this course. It's like really, um, hands down to to those guys. Um, it's 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 a fantastic brand. It's fantastic looking cars, and um, let's put it to say, almost every Aston Martin I see from from the beginning of the brand is something which I really like. And All right. 
Question number two, uh, which is in your perspective, and this can be somebody you have worked with or have not worked with, it doesn't really matter, the most influential designer uh, that has impacted you as a person and in your profession? Um, should I drop names or not? <laughs> you, can, you can literally just, uh, you know, you can say one pe person, two people. I, I don't care. Just to give us a little bit of an idea, yeah. you know, where your thinking process and obviously your mm -hmm. creativity is coming from. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, I think, immediately three to four persons which really, which really influenced me. And um, I'm, I'm so thankful for them and the people know who I'm talking about, you know, uh, maybe I can put it this way. There, there's someone from the Volkswagen Audi side I'm very thankful for. There's someone who is, who is uh, on, the, on, on the very responsible position at Kia at the moment, which I'm very thankful for his comments and his, his just, you know, uh, dialogues. And um, yeah, those people I'm referring to are those kind of designers which are on high, high level positions uh, in the design OEM world and even also on the tier one world, which are still nice persons and uh, still obviously are able to lead a team without being an asshole. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me put one extra question into that. Um, coming back to our topic in the beginning, who was the one you've learned the most about the business side and not just about the creative side? Who was, who was that person where you said, you know, understanding business, that guy is, is somebody who really affected me and especially what we're working in? This, interestingly, I would say someone from, from, from the tier one supplier. This is not the tier one kind of world where I was working in, which was already helpful, but this is someone from another big, big tier one supplier and um if if you see how he acts how he's traveling all the time to just get things done and to just you know see how he gets you know within timings and budgets uh, you know a certain project made i think that's that's uh very insightful and uh admirable and is probably also underestimated by many many yeah. people out there all right now last but not least yeah if i would give you any money whatsoever which car would you buy I think this is the most unfair question. <laughs> and I stick to that because whenever you're asking this question, I was thinking how oh, you can make a choice. <laughs> um, I would. Ah, that's 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 really that's mission. It's it's mission impossible. I mean, at the end, because I am a fan of Aston Martin, I would buy probably a 177. Oh wow! Because mm -hmm. I think it's 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 a collectible. It's it's not a classic classic Aston Martin, you know. But um, I think it's it's a standalone piece, and um, I would not regret my decision in this case rather than on another car. <laughs> <laughs> but again. Again, I, I would I would be Jay Leno in his garage if I had the money. So, <laughs> well, this this is this is the thing, you know. It's oftentimes what uh, you know, you know, just in like a retrospect. Obviously, people talking talking after the recording of the show, a lot of them is like, oh, you know, should I have taken this kind of car or that kind of car? And it's oftentimes what I realize is the gut feeling. It's just like the one that yeah. comes to mind first. It's not necessarily the one that if you think about it for five, ten, fifteen minutes, like the one that you would actually buy. But it's there's often there's obviously a an emotional factor to that, you know. And everybody who says this kind of first car, there is some kind of emotion with that. It doesn't matter what it is, but um, it's it's that's what I find the interesting part of it. You know, it's it's almost like you can't really compare and you know prepare uh, for the for the question properly because yeah. once you start thinking about it for too long, then it's exactly that point. It's like. Shit, there's like 15. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah. <laughs> exactly, but, but still maybe as a last sentence, you can add one. It's a Boeing 747. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. That's, uh, okay. that's obviously a mobility uh, space as well. <laughs> I'll take that all day long. Um, so, uh, yeah. Ben, I do really much appreciate the time. Thank you very much for doing this with me. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And of course, uh, dear people listening to this, you can always connect with Ben. Uh, we will do that in the show notes as well on LinkedIn. Uh, he's always open to have you know uh, an exchange with people. I can uh, I can tell you that from my own experience. Otherwise, we would have never gotten in touch properly. And uh, yeah, so if you have any questions to him, let him know. Send him a quick message. The same obviously goes for me. But um, once again, Ben, thank you very much, and uh, to all of our listeners. You will hear from us very soon again with another lovely conversation with somebody out of the design industry. Thank you, Marty. My pleasure. And 
hope to see you soon again. <laughs> <laughs> We will arrange that, don't worry. <laughs> All right. <laughs>